I literally thought I was losing my mind. My arms would go numb. My hearing actually would become muffled. You have a sense of you're in a dream. You can't breathe, you have chest pains. You might tremble, you sweat. I didn't feel in control when it came to my thoughts. I was impulsive, lying a lot. I felt absolutely hopeless. I didn't think that there was a way to feel better. I didn't think that I wanted to feel better. You want to be productive and you want to get all of these things done, but then at the same time, you find yourself very distracted in this self-wallow of like, I can't really do anything. Glad you guys made it through the fog this morning. Is it still foggy out there? Yeah, a little icy. So uh, Pastor Don was so nice to introduce me today, and um, I'm just going to throw him under the bus because he's not here. And he was at the first service online, so I can do that. <laughs> um, but so I was going to borrow Pastor Don's truck tomorrow, and he told me it was still in the shop, still in the shop. So it's been in all week. So I'm just telling you, his truck is not as reliable as he says it is. I think... <laughs> I think that Zach's is still in his garage, and for the record, my car is not in the shop. And so I can still Uber around the two of them as they need it. So I'm glad to be with you today. <laughs> and um, I am going to talk about trauma, and I am so glad that we're in a church where we can talk about mental health, where we can dispel some of the myths and we can dispel some of the stigma around it to know that we all have to work on our mental health. It's just a part of our life. And as I'm talking about trauma today, the one thing that comes to my mind, and maybe if you're a first responder or if you're a, a doctor, a nurse, some are medical professionals, um, the first thing that came to my mind is I think about a trauma unit at a hospital. And so if you've ever been to a trauma unit at the hospital, you can tell when somebody's hurt. I was there once, um, actually more than once, but I've been on a trauma unit, and I, the first time I was there, I saw somebody I worked with who had been in a car accident. And I could very visibly see how she was hurt. She had bruises, she had life support machines, she had broken bones, she had all of these things going on. So I could tell very easily that she was broken inside, that something was going on. But when we talk about emotional trauma, it's not the things that we can see. If we have emotional or spiritual trauma, we can't see those. But the wounds that we can't see are just as painful as the ones that we can and so I just want to take a moment to recognize that for us and to know that, one, the trauma isn't what happened to somebody. It's our response after the, the event. So when I say trauma today, I'm going to be talking about the processing feelings afterwards, not the event itself. Because that woman who was in the hospital that I visited with, she was in the hospital because she was in a car accident with three other people. So they're all in the same accident, and the other two people, one of them left the hospital within, a, I think, a day and a half. The other one had to have some surgeries, but she was fine. And the woman that was on the trauma unit eventually lost her life because of the accident. Same event, all different outcomes for those ladies. And so as we're talking about trauma, that's what we're doing. And I want to also recognize that as I've talked to some people coming in today, even they've expressed to me that they're not okay today, that things are hard and they're in the middle of it. And they have a lot of feelings that are really difficult. And so if you're in that place today, I want to say it's okay for you not to be okay here today. It's permission for you guys to, to be able to feel your feelings. We don't want to dismiss those. I don't in any way in shape or form want to dismiss them, and neither does God. Because it's such a sensitive subject, I really do want to invite God into this. So I want to pray and invite the Holy Spirit to be with us today as we go on. Father God, I thank you. I thank you that you care about every last thing that happens with us, God. You care about all of the pain in this room right now, whether it's from recent things or from the past, God, you care about it. God, I ask that your Holy Spirit would minister to the people in this room right now and the people that are online. I ask that you bring healing and an increased measure of healing, God, as we talk. I ask that you would bring truth to this whole matter of trauma. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So like I said, trauma is that lasting emotional response that often results from living through a distressing event. And I think it's really helpful for me when I get information, 
right? And so like, what is trauma really about then? If I'm talking about physical trauma, it's very easy to see what does emotional trauma look like and what causes some of that emotional trauma? So we're gonna look at three different types of trauma and the first one is acute. And it's a response to a one-time event. And it's a short term, it has short-term effects. It's typically a quicker recovery period. And examples are car accidents or assault. And those things, even though they're horrible, I'm not gonna say none of that's horrible, they are horrible. They are shorter lived in, a, in a, an acute trauma um, place. So like my kids witnessed my friend's house burn down. We watched it go from little puffs of smoke to the whole house burning down. My kids were traumatized by that, but it was an acute trauma because it was only a one-time event and we were able to deal with their emotions and they were able to move on and not have long lasting effects from it. Um, the second thing is chronic trauma. And that's multiple repetitive events and it creates this cumulative effect. So like every time you go through it, it, it accumulates. It doesn't, it's not one more event that you go through. It's like this one time event, this one time event, it actually gets worse. And so some of those things are like ongoing abuse, domestic violence, being bullied at school. Um, a lot of our, our veterans um, are in our combat service have dealt with PTSD because of it, because they have that cumulative effect. And then the last one is complex trauma. And that's response to events that happen early in life. And they're in the formative years. It affects our abilities to form secure attachments. It affects how we um, are able to cope and function. And, um, and some examples of that would be childhood abuse, neglect, abandonment, or witnessing ongoing domestic violence or, or abuse. And what's interesting about this is some studies. The CDC has some things out, and it says 64 percent of adults in the U.S. report having one of these experiences as a child. And so they, they talk about these adverse childhood experiences, and we're just talking about childhood right now. So the adverse childhood experiences are, that they're talking about are abuse, neglect, witnessing violence in the home or community, a family member attempting to die by suicide, a home environment that undermines their safety and security, such as substance abuse, mental health issues, or instability due to separation, uh, parent separation. So that could be divorce, that could be somebody being in prison or in jail. Those all affect a child. And so they say 64% of U.S. adults have experienced at least one of these. And if you've experienced more than one of these, it also is a cumulative effect and you can have more issues because of that and more things happen in your life. And why does that matter? Because we cope really horribly with this. <laughs> if we don't deal with the emotions that come, we, we end up with things like um, addiction, we end up with depression, anxiety, all the stuff we're talking about with mental health, a lot of that stems from trauma that we have gone through that we haven't been able to process through. And it matters because it affects everybody around you when you don't heal. If you don't heal, it not only just affects you, it affects your whole family, it affects your friends, it affects our church, it affects any community that you are in when you're unhealed from trauma. The other thing is we know it, when we experience trauma, it happens and if we, um, we, we don't, if we do deal with it, we know that it changes us and it changes everybody around us too. And so because we know it happens to us and because we know if we don't take care of it, it affects everybody. And if we do take care of it, it affects everybody too. But it affects them in a positive way this time instead of a negative way. So there's hope for healing because of this. And it's important to me today because I know that most of you have experienced this in this room or you will. You'll experience an event that will that potentially could cause trauma. But we're gonna talk about um, somebody in the Bible. And I know sometimes the Bible is hard to read for some of you. I know that I've heard that feedback from people and they're like, I don't know where to start. I don't know, like it doesn't make sense to me. Well, hold your horses today because we're gonna hear about Joseph. And this is like a Netflix miniseries meets a Jerry Springer show, okay? So this is some very interesting things we're going to learn about Joseph. We're going to start by giving his, his family tree because we need a scorecard. Do you need a scorecard for your family tree? Somebody need, if you could explain it to me, I wouldn't understand it. That's what we need to do for Joseph. So Joseph is the son of Jacob. So Jacob worked seven years because he wanted to marry the woman he loved. And instead of getting the woman he loved, Rachel, um, Rachel's dad, Laban, gave him his other daughter, Leah, so he worked for seven years, ended up marrying Leah, and he worked seven more years so he could marry the woman that he loved. And so now he's married to these two women who are sisters. I don't know, you have sisters? A little bit of competition there going on? 
I'd encourage you to go back because we're in, we're in Genesis 37. Go back and look right prior to that and see the back and forth between the two sisters because it is hysterical. Um, so Leah ends up having six sons. And so Rachel is having trouble having kids. So she gives Jacob her servant to have kids with. So Jacob has two kids with her servant. Then Leah gives her servant. He has two more kids with her. Eventually, Rachel has two sons. And Joseph is one of those sons. And the reason that it, that's important is because we know that Jacob's favorite wife is Rachel. And because Jacob's favorite wife is Rachel, Joseph is his favorite son. And so that creates a lot of drama in a family, right? If you have a favorite son, you, you, know, you never want to have a favorite in your house, no matter how many children you have. But we go on to see that when Jacob was little, he would go out to the fields and check on his brothers, and he would come back and he would tell on them. <laughs> so he would be the narc that came in. So not only was he favored, but he would come back and give bad reports about his older brothers. So that couldn't have been helpful to his status with his brothers either. And then Jacob, his dad, gives him this ornate cloak or robe, or he gives him this amazing, like, and he doesn't give it to any of the other kids. So he gives this one thing to, and it stands him out from every other child that he has. So like he has this wonderful ornate robe on him and nobody else has that. So not only do they know that Jacob favors him, but they are looking at it every single day that Joseph is the favorite. And it's like when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and could not speak a kind word to him. I was like, wow, could not speak a kind word. I remember my mom saying, if you can't say anything kind, don't say anything at all, right? So we had silent dinners. <laughs> but <laughs> they couldn't speak a kind word to him, So, which leads me to believe they spoke unkind words to him because I don't believe that they were silent. And so I would say at this point, he was probably being verbally abused by his brothers. I wouldn't, that's not a far stretch to go to. Well, then Joseph kind of muddies the pot a little bit because he gets a dream from God and says that all his brothers and his family are going to bow down to him. And so that didn't make him super popular <laughs> because you're like, all these people that hate you, now you say you're going to bow down to me. And uh, I don't think that went over really well. So then Joseph gets sent out by his father to the field to find his brothers one day. And as he's going to find them, they see him. They see him way off in the distance. They see him and they're... Their initial instinct is, how are we going to kill them? So they see them come and they're like, how are we going to kill them? Not, I would be thinking, how can I avoid them? <laughs> how can I get away from them? But they're saying, they're plotting. They're like, well, should we do this? Should we do that? They're plotting to kill their brother. So his brother, his oldest brother, Reuben, steps in and they don't end up killing him, but they end up putting him in the cistern, which holds, holds water. So basically, he, they put him in a pit and they're trying to decide what to do with him. And this caravan comes by, and they sell him to this caravan going into Egypt. And so he's sold into slavery. And they take his coat that his father had made for him that was so ornate and so beautiful, and they put goat's blood on it and take it back to his dad. So when his dad sees this, Jacob thinks his, his son is dead, his favorite son, and he mourns and he cries. And he just, he, he's, he's, having trauma, honestly. He's mourning over his son, who he assumes has died at this point. <clears throat> so then Joseph's in Egypt now, and he gets sold over to Potiphar, which is one of the officials in Pharaoh's army, or in his, in his kingdom. And so he goes into Potiphar's house, and he takes care of everything that's going on in his house. And it tells us that everything that the Lord was with Joseph, so he prospered. Because Joseph prospered, Potiphar prospered. So he put him in charge of everything in his house. It tells us a little bit later that Potiphar didn't worry about anything except for what he was going to eat. So he had this, this, a lot of stuff. Joseph took care of everything, and everything was going great because Joseph was in charge of it. Then comes in Potiphar's wife. Well, Potiphar's wife says, Joseph was well-built and handsome, and after a while, his master, his wife, took notice of Joseph and said, come to bed with me. So Potiphar's wife wants to sleep with a servant, Joseph. And Joseph says no, and he doesn't, he's not going to do that. He gives all the reasons why he's not going to do that. And she persists. 
and says, even though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. So we would call this sexual harassment and call HR, right? That would be what we would do nowadays. Like, like I don't, yeah, that's sexual harassment every day. He, wouldn't, he didn't even want to be with her. And if you've ever been in that situation, you don't want to be with a person that's doing that to you. You're going to try to get as far away from that as you can. So he's tried to stay away from her. But then one day he goes to the house to do the work that he normally does. And none of, those, none of the servants were there. Surprise, surprise. I think that was a setup. So, and Potiphar's wife grabs him by the cloak. So she's physically holding him now and says, come to bed with me. So now we've stepped it up a notch. She's assaulting him, right? She's holding on to him. She's not letting him go anywhere. And he gets out of his cloak somehow and he takes off. And then she says, he tried to rape me. He calls her servants, in, her servants in and says, he tried to rape me. So she tries to, attempts to rape him and she blames it on him. And so then her husband finds out, puts him in jail. It's like, whew, I told you. It's like a whole mini series here. I'm trying to like give you guys a picture of what's going on here. <clears throat> so then the Lord was with him in prison even. It says the Lord was with him again. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all that were held in the prison and made him responsible for all that was done there. So again, God is with Joseph and he prospers him wherever he is. Whether he's in prison, it doesn't matter. God prospers him there. And the warden doesn't care about anything anymore. He doesn't pay attention to anything because Joseph is taking care of it all, similar to Potiphar. Potiphar didn't pay attention to anything anymore because Joseph was doing it too. And then Joseph ends up, with God's help, interpreting a dream, ends up in front of Pharaoh, because Pharaoh needed this dream interpreted. He interprets it for him, with God's help, and tells Pharaoh what's to come for Egypt, that they're going to have seven years of plenty, seven years of, of famine, or, or nothing. And so he puts Joseph in charge. He says, then he says, since God has made this all known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace and all my people are to submit to your orders. So now Joseph's in Pharaoh's house, and because he was able to follow what God had him do, he becomes in charge of Egypt. And he is in charge of everything that's going on there, and he's only second to the Pharaoh himself. So we're going to do a quick, 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 quick recap. He's hated by his brothers, so we got verbal abuse, almost murdered, sold into slavery twice, sexually harassed, physically assaulted, attempted rape, wrongfully accused by someone in power over him, and went to prison. Do you think that Joseph understood events that might cause trauma? It gives me a picture of knowing that God knows the events that might cause us trauma as well. And we talk about bringing life to these places. We talk about bringing life all the time as a church, and this is where God can bring life to us. And so we're going to look at how do we heal from trauma. And the first thing we have here is we process our emotions with a trauma. It's really hard because with trauma, you, like my first gut reactions to trauma are like, suck it up. It's not that bad. You can handle it. Other people have worse things going on. It's not that important. Nobody wants to hear that. It hurts too bad for me to say anything. I should be stronger than that. It's not really that big of a deal. And we end up stuffing it. And it keeps us from healing. So when we process our emotions, we're not processing the trauma itself. We're not processing what happened. You wouldn't have to go through all that. You would re-traumatize yourself if you did that. But you process how you feel. Like, how do I feel when that happened? Like, what are my feelings right now? What is hard for me right now? So if you were to break your leg, I couldn't just walk up here on my leg and run around and do the things I normally do if I break my leg, can I? I can't pretend that it's not broken. I can't pretend it doesn't hurt. I could, but it wouldn't work very well, would it? I mean, I'd probably limp around on it for a while and it wouldn't heal right. And it's the same thing with our emotions. We can't pretend that it's not there and it doesn't hurt. Our emotions are there, they're valid. They hurt sometimes. And just like with a leg where I get help from a doctor and maybe my friends go and help me get some groceries or help me with my kids or take me to the doctors or whatever that is, I need support around that, right? It's really easy for us to see that and get support around that 
sometimes it's harder for us to look at our emotions and say, I need support around those. Because it's a little scary to open up and let somebody know that that's how it feels right now. But that's what it takes. It takes that warm, it's that warm response to what happens in our life. And I'll give you a, a couple of examples. In Sierra Leone, there were children who were taken from their families and they were put into, a, they were put into war, so they were soldiers. They had unspeakable things happen to them. They had women, they had girls and boys. The girls were raped often. Sometimes they came home with babies. Um, and they had to do unspeakable things as well, because many of them had to kill people. They were in war. So not only did they have things happen to them that were unspeakable, they had to do things that were unspeakable. And when these children came back, they've done a long study that's over 20 years now of what happened to those kids when they came back um, to Sierra Leone. And what they found is that kids came home that got reunited with their families, because not all of them did, and had this warm understanding in the community and their families. They did really well. They finished school, they had families, they thrived financially in their jobs and things like that. And the children who didn't have that, who maybe came back and didn't find their families, or maybe their families weren't there anymore, um, maybe they were still stigmatized because the girl came back pregnant, all of those things, they didn't have that warm understanding from people. They ended up with poor outcomes. And just physically, um, they would die earlier. They had dead-end jobs, I would call them. And they didn't have good relationships. Because trauma affects us like that. We, we have all these different things that we do to try to suppress it, like addiction and like watching Netflix so that we don't have to think about things. And you can name a bunch of things yourself. What do you do to not think about something? You know what you do. And we do everything to try to mask that. And so that's what those little kids would do, do everything to mask that. And they had such poor outcomes. And myself, when I, um, we went through some stuff with my husband a few years ago, and I've shared it pretty readily. You guys, a lot of you might know it. My husband had um, a double bypass almost two years ago now, two years ago next month. And um, before that, he had a Widowmaker heart attack, which, praise God, he lived. And then six months later, he had to have double bypass. During that time when he had double bypass, I was terrified. I had just watched friends lose their, their husbands. Um, it was hard for my friends sometimes. And I had people who stuck by me. I didn't have to talk about all this medical stuff. I didn't talk about how scared I was all the time. They sat with me in the waiting room. They brought me food. They brought me coffee. They sent me Starbucks gift cards because they knew I would drink Starbucks. <laughs> But, but they were with me, and they checked on me, and they brought me stuff from the house if I needed, or they checked on my kids. Um, I had people drop off groceries to my kids so that they could make dinner. Um, I had warm understanding from those people, which I would say just is compassion. And because of that, I think I walked through it differently. You know, it was way easier for me to walk through that because I had those people around me. That's really important. So the second thing... We'd say we need to press into God with our trauma. We'll look at this verse here in Psalm. It says, The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. So when you're broken, when you're hurting that bad, God is close to you. And some of you are broken today. And God's close to you. And I, and I think of another example from my own life is when um, my husband and I got married and our first child, we lost in miscarriage. I know some of you have been there. Some of you had worse things happen. I was devastated. I was devastated because I just wanted to be a mom. And I was like, why, God? Why would you do that? That's not fair. What about this person who doesn't care? And this is what I've wanted, and you, I don't get it? Like, what in the world? And I was able to tell God exactly how I felt because I knew he was close to me, and I didn't understand. And I needed to be honest about where I was, because honestly, God already knows how I feel. <laughs> he already knows. He's not surprised by anything I'm going to say. So I told him how I felt. Then I look at Psalm 56. It says, You keep track of all my sorrows. You have collected my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. 
Every tear you cry, every tear you cry, God holds in a bottle. He records it. He cares that much about the things that you're going through. And if God cares that much about our emotions, we should care about them too. He has ways for us to heal, and that's by pressing into him more. He records every one of your tears in his book. I can't even count my own tears. You know, you ugly cry. You all know that. You ugly cry. I have no idea how many tears I I cry, but God does. That's pretty amazing to me. Nothing can change your past, but God can heal your heart. He can change you. Number three is pursue purpose in the pain. Okay, I'm just going to give a disclaimer here because if you, right now, are struggling, you might not be ready for pursuing purpose in pain. I don't want to to push you into something and discount pain that might be going on right now. So just know that as we're going forward. It's okay to not be okay today. We're just going to embrace that. But when we look at 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians, sorry, it says, Praise be to God, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. What I want you to notice here is that when we let God comfort us in any trouble, it says any, in our troubles, in our troubles, when I have trouble, God can comfort me. When I have that comfort, I can comfort those in any trouble. It doesn't have to be the same trouble that I'm going through because I've received God's comfort. I can in turn turn to my friend and give them comfort without even knowing what they're going through because it's the comfort that comes from God, not from me. I'm not solving their problem. God is. God is healing them. And so I love this verse. I love this verse because it doesn't matter what you've gone through. It doesn't matter that you haven't gone through the thing that your friend is going through because you've had your own things. And when God comforts you in those things, you can comfort them in anything that they're going through with the comfort that God gives you. I think that's just amazing. It's like the love of God flowing through you all the time. It's that comfort that God gives you. So we need to revisit Joseph so we know the end of the story. So the end of the story, Joseph is in charge of Egypt. And Egypt planned. God prospered Joseph where he was. He gave him wisdom. They planned for the famine that was to come. And they had storehouses of grain. And Joseph's brothers come to him and ask him for grain. And they don't recognize him. Joseph tests them a little bit and finds out that they, are, they have changed and there is some remorse there and they are being honorable. And so he tells them, and he kind of breaks down a little bit before he tells them that he's their brother. And then he has them go get their dad and their younger brother, Benjamin, and they come back to Egypt and they live with him. And because of Joseph's position, they don't have to, they tell him not to even bring anything because they have everything that they need in Egypt for them. His brothers do end up bowing down to him. But God had purpose in what he was doing in Joseph's life. And maybe it wasn't exactly how God wanted it to happen because there's sin involved, but God still has purpose for our life. So maybe it's not something that should happen, and maybe it's not the way God wanted it to happen, but he still is going to purposely move you forward because he has purpose for you. No matter what you've been through, you're not discounted from that. And we use that comfort to comfort other people. And that's a verse here in Romans. We know that all things work together for those who love God and who love him and have been called according to his purpose. And sometimes we use that to discount pain, and that's why I don't want to discount pain here. But there is purpose in it when you have gotten that healing. And there's time. We need time to heal. That doesn't go right away. You know, God heals us over time. And we want normal, right? Like when something happens like that, you just wanted to go back to normal. I think COVID was the ultimate one. It's like we all just like, we just wanted to go back to normal. We're just, that was was a, a corporate kind of trauma that we went through. We wanted to go back to normal, but it's not going to. I'm just going to tell you it doesn't. You experience something, it's not going to be normal again. It's going to be different. Jesus had the ultimate trauma and understands it. Jesus sweat blood in the Garden of Gethsemane and then handed himself over to people who were going to humiliate him, torture him, and murder him. And when he rose from the dead, Jesus still had scars. He still had scars. And when 
when Thomas asked him and was doubting who he was, he said, feel my scars, put your hand in my side. His scars were still there. They didn't heal. That had changed him. The trauma had changed him. But when we have trauma and we heal from it, we become resilient. And it changes, we become stronger. And you're able to help other people. And Jesus can say, here, here's my scars. And I can say, here, here's my scars. I've been through it. Maybe not exactly what you've been through, but I've been through some stuff. And I can help you. I can stand by you. I can love you. I can pray for you. I can do that. We all can do that. I'm going to look at that 2 Corinthians verse again because I just love this when we talk about trauma. It's that he, com- he comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. So I'm going to ask you to do something here. <laughs> and I'm going to ask you guys all to kind of put your hand on, not kind of, but actually, put your hand on the shoulder of the person next to you. I want everybody to have a shoulder, a hand on a shoulder. So if you're sitting by yourself, we got, I, this is the seat. Everybody that sits right there doesn't have it. Just put a hand on that man's shoulder. <laughs> We're going to practice being the comfort for other people, okay? That's the kind of church we are. We want to be that church all the time. We want to be able to walk through the valleys with people when they're struggling. And so this is a practical example of us being the body of Christ and giving comfort to those around us. So I'm going to pray, and you're going to agree with me as we pray over the people that you have hands on. Everybody's got somebody touching them, right? Yep, we're good. All right, I'm going to pray. Father God, I thank you. I thank you for these beautiful people in this room. God, I ask that in the places that they're hurt, in the places that they're afraid to speak of, that are so deep and they might go back to childhood even, God, and they've been masking it for so long, I ask that you would heal them. God, I ask that we can walk alongside them and help them to heal, God, I ask that you would bring comfort in this room right now. God, I ask if it's grief, if it's abuse, God, I ask for for healing. I ask if there's been violence against them, God, that you would bring healing. I ask if there's been neglect, that you'd bring healing. God, I ask that you would Show us who we are in you today. And that we would heal even more after this time. Thank you that you are a God that loves us, that keeps those tears in a jar. That you record them because you love us that much, God. And we ask for healing for each person in this room from the things that they have gone through. And we trust that you have purpose for us as we walk forward in that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.